I always heard a lot about the Comptons, and I kind of thought I knew about them, and but I did know they'd make a great uh, Durango Native story. But I got to tell you, it was humbling to hear their story, and these are the most organized people I've ever met in their life. And right before the show, Penny told me, Jack, don't talk. So I'm done. And this is the Compton family. This is Ted, or Ted Compton, Generation 2, Leanne Compton, or Compton uh, Harbison, and Tom and Penny Compton, who I'm so proud to call my friends now. I never knew them before this week. I think I'm supposed to start this thing off and... Um, I'm super nervous about being on a microphone. So if I'm screaming at you, will you please let me know? <laughs> there are three adorable young people passing out napkins. I know that seems a little bit odd. We are not trying to call you guys messy, but we are passing out some napkins that the cowbells, is that right? The cowbells put out each year. Um, and you have a little assignment to try and find the Compton Cattle Company brand on your napkins, if you can see better than I can, I hope. Um, our brand is a uh, T slash L. This is my brother Ted, and I'm Leanne. That's where the T and L come. Don't, don't put that down just yet. It's a really important part here. You'll notice that the L, that's right side up. The T, that's upside down. <laughs> I don't know if that's she, oh. she didn't say which one was in front and which one was in back. <laughs> um, I think since you since everyone's been introduced now, um, I, 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 we're supposed to get some pictures now, right? Well, hold, let's go. Let's go here. Guess who? <laughs> Mom and Dad, Tom and Penny. Uh, if I'm seeing it properly in front of uh, Ayers Rock in Australia, Uluru, and and one of uh, one of Penny's favorite quotes from uh, Samuel Clemens: "Travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. Wholesome views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime." So we feel extremely lucky to be long-term residents, native of Durango. Um, but as you will see, um, we're also going to talk quite a bit about uh, how lucky we are and how important we feel it is to, to experience the world and to travel. Along with travel, there's going to be three other major themes that we'll bounce around back and forth to. And, and those are uh, also things that, that my mom and dad have, have instilled in the family throughout all our lives and we think is extremely important. Um, community service, ranching, education, and then back to travel. And, uh, and you'll hear about these themes throughout the rest of uh, our stories and, and slides that you're going to see. My grandparents uh, lived in the Largo Canyon. Uh, the Kane side, that was my mother's side of the family, he went to School of Mines back in the beginning of the 1900s but had always wanted to be in ranching. And I, I think you see some of that now. We see a lot of people who, who, who like cowboy boots. They may not like to get them dirty. <laughs> 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 they do uh, like a, a touch of the Western ranch style. And so my grandfather uh, decided that he was going to be a rancher, even though he had an engineering degree from School of Mines. So he started out down in New Mexico, uh, got married at a young age, I think she was 18, and they started looking for a place that would have water, that they could homestead, and apparently spent several years trying to find water and going down in the holes and finding rattlesnakes and whatever else you would find out there but uh, very little water until they got up into the Largo Canyon. They called it the High Lonesome at that time, and I, I think it probably was it because it was so high and it was so lonesome. Um, at this, they also lived very unique lives. I think they started out their lives in a, my brother calls it a cave, I think <laughs> some people call it a dugout, 
um, but proceeded to find water 180 feet down over the edge of the cliff. So that was where they had their water source. Now, interestingly, they had a swimming pool. <laughs> they had a 12-room house. My grandmother, who I was told walked four miles when she was 12 years old to get to piano lessons, uh, had her piano with her at all times. So wherever they moved, the piano went with her. And, and I know that's true because uh, part of the family has that piano now. So they uh, built this house, <coughs> which had all the classics and Victrola and a swimming pool and uh, cattle. And, and sheep must have gotten worked in there at some time because they had, and it's the way my mother met my dad, they also had land up at the Lemon Dam. And um, I was told that it took them 10 days to move the cattle from the High Lonesome, from the Largo Canyon, up to uh, near the Lemon Dam. And uh, they all walked and they all moved cattle for 10 days. And uh, I think they kept that place probably even uh, up and maybe even after the Lemon Dam was built because I think it was a little bit farther down. There uh, they are with the horse and buggy. I don't see a piano on there. <laughs> uh, my uncle over here on the right, uh, Mary Jane and I were talking earlier how when it rained, you didn't go any place. I mean, you just truly would sink down into the mud and you could not. So there's my uncle with you carrying his boots in uh, probably shortly after a rain. He also, you see him there in, he was in World War II, uh, lost his leg in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, came back home, put on a wooden leg and proceeded to ride his horse and ranch the rest of his life. I think it was a little hard for Tom to keep up with him sometimes, wasn't it? When Imp impossible. <laughs> you, you wouldn't even know he had a wooden leg except he got on the horse on the wrong side. <laughs> and they had so much acreage up there that they would have cattle, you know, there were no fences at that time. And so they would gather cattle probably, what, once a year, twice a year? I don't know, maybe just once a year. And they would go out with all the cowboys and Tom, I think, was just beginning to cowboy at that time. And they would ride from morning to night and gather all the cattle that they could gather. So that's the Kane family. Uh, we move on over to the Lemon side. And a, a number of you know that the Lemon Dam is named after uh, my family. This article ran in the Durango Herald. Uh, at some point, run away at seven, he built a big life. And he truly did. We were told that when he was uh, three, uh, the family brought 250 head of cattle from Texas up to um, the Gunnison area, I think, and um, had cattle. And at seven, uh, his father died, and he didn't get along with his stepfather, so he left and from the age of seven on he was on his own and ended up one of the quotes in the herald i think at that time was he was one of the best healed ranchers in the county at his retirement um, and that's your grand that's your grandfather that's my grandfather and my parents they're next to them so we have two generations right there he uh, to make it on his own from being seven years old, learned how to, uh, he worked in a livery. Worked in a livery stable, yeah. And did. L learned how to handle a team, drive a team, yeah. learned how to pack animals, pack horses. And that's how he made his living as he grew older. He, he w used to uh, drive the stage from uh, uh, Uray over to Silverton. He talks about uh, how they would have, uh, sometimes they would bring gold out of some of the mines 
and that they would have a guard in front and a guard in back. And he was the one in front, and the one in back, they were being robbed one day. And so he ran his horse around, and he said he was looking down the barrel of the gun. Uh, but the robbers simply wanted the gold and took it and were on their way. We <laughs> talked about how and how people now find Red Mountain Pass closed when the snow is bad, and he said they never closed the pass, <laughs> but they always could uh, get the mail over and back uh, with their team of horses. He uh, came to uh, the Durango area from Gunnison and bought several pieces of land. He said he borrowed his first $200 from one of the banks and that he banked there ever since that time. Um, but he would uh, end up owning the Lemon Dam area. And when the government decided to put in a dam up there, apparently he gave them a hard time about who they were going to hire to put in that dam and where they were going to put it. They said, uh, they kept referring to him as that damn lemon. And, <laughs> and some of the government agencies said at that time that the, the dam would be named the Lemon Dam. Uh, you, you see there a picture of uh, my father and his father, my grandfather, the one who had the Lemon Dam. They were in business together and my uh, father started out with a dokey calf. It's a calf that's not very healthy, I think. And uh, he, they wanted him to go on to school. And he said he was going to be a rancher. He was not going to continue school. He went through the eighth grade. And he gathered uh, cattle together. He had 75 pairs by the time he was 16, I think it was, by trading with his father for a heifer calf every time he had a bull calf, which is kind of a traditional way of building, building your stock. Um, so he uh, ended up owning land at the Lemon Dam, uh, owned land all over the country, and I'm not quite sure how he, he I guess when, when they had cattle, after they had established a cattle herd up at the Lemon Dam, he said one morning, uh, I think it was 1931, he got up and the hired hand came in and said, there are 35 dead calves outside. This was a very brutal winter. And uh, he says, that's okay, we're all alive, we'll make it. And it, apparently they lost about 200 head of cattle that winter. Um, but he, um, <coughs> according to everything I read, was an incredibly smart businessman. And he sold off land up there, other than the Lemon Dam area, and was able to hold on to the uh, timber. Timber rights, yeah. The timber rights. So he sold the timber then for as much as he had in the land. You know, they used to cut down trees, make boards out of them, and <laughs> build stuff. We, we don't do that anymore, so. Tell us about that photo right there. Okay, so that has been superimposed because that is my dad with me, and that's Peggy, and you know, growing up on a ranch, everyone always had their little horses, and I rode probably from the time I was three alone, and uh, you know, that one, was uh, when we had land up Lightning Creek, wasn't it? And we would go on these narrow trails, and I just went along like I was an adult. And uh, Peggy sl uh, slipped off the edge, and I, I maintained that she stood there until my dad could rescue me, and I still get emotional about that because I can still feel be, being there. And Peggy rolled down the hill, probably, I don't know, 300 feet, I don't know. Um, and she was fine. Uh, uh, 
the, 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 saddle, the saddle was not fine, but the saddle looked better than that saddle right there now. <laughs> that was my grandfather's saddle, and it has been being used as a prop at a dude ranch for the last 30, 40 years. He really <laughs> didn't ride it till it looked that bad. Uh, yeah, the, you know, one of the points is that ranching uh, it can be dangerous at times. And in fact, if you fool around the horses, sooner or later you're probably going to get hurt. Um, I, you know, I, uh, we, were, we were checking cattle up on the permit up in the mountains, and I was on a green horse, a, a, a newly trained horse. <laughs> and uh, so we got down in a draw, and he got scared and lunged to get out, and he fell down, broke my leg. And so my good, good friends I was with, my, well, her dad and a couple of ranch hands. I think Ted was there, too. Were you there, Ted? I probably didn't carry you. <laughs> They didn't carry me anywhere except they got a, 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 a little piece of quakey and made a splint and took their bandanas and wrapped them all around my leg, propped me back on the horse, and we rode back down to headquarters, threw me in the back of a stock truck, which was full of horse effluent. <laughs> Drove me into town, got to the hospital. This was the old Mercy Hospital. And, uh, and, and I could have got in there and got fixed pretty quick, except all the nurses wanted to break, go get their cameras and come and take a picture of me with that fancy splint on my leg. <laughs> but it all turned out okay. We had a little fight over whether they were going to cut my boot off or whether did, did they, they? Just, they just pull it off so it, it wouldn't hurt it. Now, Penny got hurt really badly. We were up uh, at the upper, upper ranch, and she got on the, on the night horse, tamest horse, gentle. You go, kids rode him all the time. She went out to get the horses in, and she disappeared. Went down in a gully, disappeared. We ran down to see her, and she was uh, unconscious. And uh, so, and again, you, you know, the uh, Jacksons were talking about the, the, the lack of cell phones at that time. It was just <laughs> terrible. <laughs> but anyway, we ran down the canyon as fast as we could. We got down to where J. Paul Brown's grandparents had a place, and uh, and they had a phone, so we called the ambulance. The ambulance came took her, to, took her to, to town, and she was unconscious for three days. And, uh, but for the most part, I think it turned out okay. <laughs> so the, the, We'll find out here tonight, won't we? <laughs> so you, you're going to get hurt if you mess around with horses. End of that story. They did, get, they did get a little smarter after all these accidents because my grandfather wanted me to go into rodeo, and they were smart enough to say no way. <laughs> There, well, I probably talk about it some other time. But Ted, if you've ever seen, you know Ted, our son Ted, he can sit on a horse better than most anyone I've ever seen. Maybe, uh, with the exception of his of his grandfather Pen Penny's dad, he, he becomes that doesn't a part sound like a horse. big deal sitting on a horse, but it actually <laughs> means something different. <laughs> I can sit on a chair really good too. <laughs> and you know, this part of the story was for later, but. Uh, <laughs> Ted's wife. Well, let's leave it for later then. Oh, no, no, I've got to do it right now. Mora is out there someplace. I, you we know, can't I, see I, you, but we, we know you're there. We can't see anyone. But uh, Ted and Mora met through some friends one evening. At Electra Lake. At Electra Lake, yes, yes. And uh, Mora had gone to DU and was on the equestrian team. So she was very much into horses. And apparently she and Ted got to probably flirting. I don't know if they used that word at that time. Um, but talking about horses, and Morris said to someone, if he can ride a horse half as good as he th says he can, I'm going to marry him. <laughs> They've been married 19 years now. Hey. Uh, their, <laughs> their daughter is out there. But that's the, uh, where the lemon dam is now. All of the cattle are there in the dam. And that is my mom and dad there in their dressed up finery, uh, ready to uh, do something I'm sure important. But let me back up for a minute because in talking about Lemon Dam, we probably should also talk about Night Horse Dam. Uh, the other part of my family was Bodo, uh, my dad's sister, uh, married uh, a Bodo, and so they owned 8,000 acres that is uh, the what, Bodo Industrial Park and Bodo... Bodo Wildlife Area. Bodo Wildlife, Wildlife area. area. Apparently there were 8,000 acres, 
and the story is they came over from Italy. I was always afraid to go out to their house because Mrs. Bodo spoke no English and you know I was a little kid and didn't know how to handle someone who didn't speak my language. But uh, Mikey Bodo, it is told, uh, won the uh, ranch in a uh, poker game. So I don't know how much of that he won. There was 8,000 acres. That sounds like a lot of land um, to win. But the word was at that time that between Bodo and Lemon, uh, they owned most of La Plata County at one time. So how they acquired it, we <laughs> will not probably ever know. <laughs> Cattle drive. So, we, so. We, we, uh, when we... We first got into ranching. We learned. Uh, I learned to ranch from Penny's dad. He taught me. Uh, I was going to say everything I know, but in fact, I did learn a couple other things afterwards. But he certainly got us started out in ranching, and and had to ranch out on the Florida Mesa out near the airport, and then and then the summer uh, ranch was up uh, Lightner Creek, Dry Fork of Lightner Creek, up on in the Platas. So twice a year we drove cattle, uh, trailed cattle up and down uh, the highway, up up back and forth and uh, uh, cattle drives are pretty interesting time and you used to be pretty common in Aplata County and not so much anymore. In fact, I don't know of anybody, at least in the immediate area, that still goes on those kinds of cattle drives. Uh, we'd take about, just about a two-day drive. We'd you know, start out real early and we'd, uh, we'd uh, night at the old uh, livestock barn, livestock auction, where uh, Home Depot is now. Well, it's now called Sail Barn Bike Trail. <laughs> that's an, I didn't no know that. No more Sail Barn, but there is a bike trail. That's I didn't what, know that. That's what they'll know is Sail Barn <coughs> Bike Trail. And, uh, and then they shut, the, shut down Sail Barn. Then we used to night herd them along the Animus River, uh, pretty close to uh, 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 where, that, where, where the... Liquor store. Park. Yeah, okay, liquor store where the park <laughs> is now. Anyway, um, so, we, you know, it was, it was a cattle drive. Yeah, we we kind of, our family, I think, Penny and I looked at... You know, th th these kind of activities like cattle drives and then, of course, branding or working cattle w w were uh, a, a, a bit of a social event, yeah, an opportunity to get a lot of people involved and to teach, to educate. Uh, a lot of people didn't know much about cattle or much about ranching. They'd come along with us. Uh, we, we've had some uh, interesting folks help us along the way. Uh, we've had... Uh, doctors and lawyers. I always really like to have a couple lawyers on the cattle drive. And, and occasionally it turns out to be a good thing. We were bringing the cattle up, up through just south of, the south end of town. And a policeman trying to be helpful came up with his siren going and the lights going like that. <laughs> and the cattle started. And so I was giving the policeman a little bit of a rough time. And uh, you, many of you, I'm sure, uh, knew Alex Tejada. Uh, you know, Alex, bless his heart, he was able to come up there and get me under control. And, and uh, he, he, you know, since Alex had represented so many people, he, he knew the policeman pretty well. So anyway, I didn't end up going to jail, and we got the cattle back together and kept, kept going up the canyon. Cattle drives are always something goes wrong. Uh, for example, Ted, you know, is left-handed. Ted broke a horse, trained a horse. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say break. <laughs> he trained a horse, a pony for Leanne, for his sister. And, uh, and that went pretty well. And she rode him a little bit. And then we went out on the cattle drive and uh, she was uh, flagging, uh, you know, waving a flag. We always cattle drive, you always call the law enforcement. Plenty of time in advance, tell them when you're going, where you're going. And then we'd have flaggers in the front, flaggers in the back, flaggers on the side. Leanne was going to flag. Leanne's right-handed. Well, this horse had never seen a right-hand flag before. And he got a little spooky and dumped her off in the road. But to her credit, she wasn't off very long. She got right back on the pony. And was, was there another option? <laughs> <laughs> Come to think of it, I don't believe there was. I didn't do it on purpose, I promise. Well, I guess the moral I of the said, story is if, if you're uh, if you're right-handed, don't get a left-handed guy to break your horse for you. <laughs> and I say I don't know any other cattle drive stories that I missed. No, there's no more. Cattle okay. No <laughs> more. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll tell you what I remember about cattle drives because I was a young girl at the time. 
Um, it was a little embarrassing. Early teens, riding a horse through the middle of town. But what I really remember is when they would hand you a hot chocolate, how much I wanted to pour the hot chocolate into the boots <laughs> instead of drink it because it was so cold. Yeah, it is cold. Coldest place in the world, and I've <laughs> been to Alaska and other cold places. Coldest place in the world is just at daylight <laughs> between what's now the uh, uh, Home Depot or Mike Trail. Yeah. Huh? Bike, bike trail, trail. Bike. Mm -hmm. and then on that on that part of the highway, just about up to where where the bridge uh, crosses the river. And these aren't built for warmth. They are not built for warmth. Yeah, they did, and we didn't have electric socks. Then. No, <laughs> <laughs> dog gone. Uh, that's the end of my cattle drive. I, I think we missed, or maybe we haven't gotten there yet, but we have to tell you the Spanish Trails Fiesta story. Back in the day, Spanish Trails Fiesta was a pretty big deal. Uh, the Cattlemen's Association, of course, had to enter a float, and my dad was very involved in the Cattlemen's Association. So the plan that year was to find a longhorn cow the uh, two floats at the top, you can't really see it, uh, but he, the plan was to have a tree, and he is up the tree with the rear end of his pants torn out and on the longhorn steer. And, and that all went well until the longhorn steer got loose. And, and the longhorn steer jumped off of the float, and my dad jumped on the horse, took that horse off the float and caught that longhorn steer and life went on and you will see him down here in the far corner with the first place trophy for <laughs> the Spanish Trails Fiesta. Now, the, the, ca the cattlemen have never won another trophy <laughs> in any parade since then. I think the next picture, if we're still in sync, yes, is uh, parades nowadays. And in this one, if you look closely in the very, very front, you'll see Leanne here holding on to the horse to make sure that it doesn't go awry. You will see Kyler on the horse by himself. And then the horse behind that is Tom with Carson, the younger one. And we even happen to have uh, Jenna Harbison on the side here, the other grandma to make sure that nothing goes wrong <laughs> with, <laughs> with this particular uh, parade. You remember her grandfather left home when he was seven because he couldn't get along with his, his uh, stepfather. We left home when we were about 30 <laughs> <laughs> because I couldn't get along with my wife's father and mother. <laughs> and so we bought, a, bought a, a ranch on our own out near in the Hesperus area out near Breen. And most of these other pictures, I think, are activities on that ranch, uh, although some of them are. You can see Ted there uh, with his horse, uh, Stormy. His shaps are up here. We have three, gener three or four generations of shaps up here. Mine are the ones with the uh, jewelry. On yeah. <laughs> the old torn up, worn out pair, those were, those were her granddad's. And they have bullet holes, uh, bullet places to put bullets along the top. Which where you put the bullets, not <laughs> <Yeah>. where. <laughs> <laughs> bullet slots. And these still get used. Yeah, they they have no bullet holes or anything. They just. <laughs> and mine could be up there too, but we didn't add those. The, neither of our kids have uh, gone into ranching, but you can see here that they have been exposed. To ranching, I see Ted up there in the corner. What's that, Tom? He's he, he's a pack with well, his pack horse, isn't it? Yes. A after he's after his great grandfather, who, who, uh, as I told you earlier, he said well, he got his start his start in life basically was learning to pack, uh, you know, pack horses. I so, might be about seven there, which would be about the same age that yeah, could, he, he took off on home. his own. He ran away and did it on his own. I don't think you made I wasn't money ready. there, did you? <laughs> How'd you get a blue cowboy hat? Well, I mean, I got blue jewelry on oh. my chaps. <laughs> no wonder. You go down to Hogan's and you buy a cowboy hat. You ask for blue. <laughs> and you will see one there of me holding Leanne in her little western attire, and I have a hat on, but at the bottom left, both of the kids are learning the essentials of 
we decided it's branding. Leanne wasn't sure what the activity was there, but we have decided that it is You know the other option, don't you? <laughs> In case you don't know, my, my dad refers to the brand as the return address on a cow. So if that happens to wander away, you know who it belongs to and how to get it home. Uh, but that brand has to be put on, and that's what we're doing there. And we, all, what we also say about branding, trust everybody but brand your cattle. <laughs> We've always tried to get, keep the kids, grandkids involved and they're, and they're happily are involved in whatever activities we have on the ranch, whether like it used to be the cattle drives. We quit doing cattle drives because people, the times they are a change in. And uh, it used to be tourists just loved the cattle drives. They'd stop, take pictures. They were understanding, everything went fine. But as time went on, People got in a really big hurry to get someplace, and and they got louder and louder horns, and it just didn't work out. So we we quit we quit uh, trailing cattle. They don't do that anymore. This is our Hesperus Ranch. After my husband uh, divulged that he couldn't get along with my mother or father or which one I don't remember. It was both of them. See, it all of the above. It's totally all of the equal. Above. Um, but. Uh, people often think that ranching is all glamour, and you do see some glamour there up in the top right-hand corner. That's Tom with a couple of men sitting around the campfire and... Telling true stories. Well, I thought it was important to point out how intelligent the decision I thought was. I think I'd already gone away to college at this time, but I heard that my, my parents were moving to, to start a ranch on the dry side. And I thought after every other ranch I knew about got flooded, I thought it was a great decision to move out to the dry side. <laughs> Turns out that's not why they call it the dry side. <laughs> if there is anything more interesting in ranching than hiring hired hands, I'm not sure what it is. On, on the left here, you see uh, one of the hired hands with Tom. We ran an ad in the paper to um, get a, a ranch hand. And so this kid shows up, and uh, we shake hands and said, what's your name? And he said, uh, uh, Jasper Hunt. And we said, okay, so we hired him. He shared a floor uh, in, in our house with us. I remember that at one birthday, we got him a really cool monogrammed belt. Cowboys sometimes put their name across the back of their belt, and so we had this thing monogrammed with Jasper right across the back of the belt. And then we couldn't figure out why he wouldn't wear it. It kind of hurt our feelings a little bit. Well, we found out quite a bit later. He had been in and out of jail a few times, and we helped him get out every single time, lots of different reasons. And so one of the times we got him out of jail, we brought him back to the house, sat down around the dinner table, because that's where you have these conversations. <laughs> and it was one of those, uh, well, you know, come to Jesus moments. And he was sitting there a little bit sheepish. And uh, he just said, well, what do you want to know? And I was a young, young boy at the time. And I said, well, how about what's your name? <laughs> and he Jasper, finally came clean. Jasper wasn't the name. Apparently, Jasper just came to him in the spur of the moment. and. Hunt, the last name he chose, came from... Truck line. You remember, you, you probably remember seeing trucks. Hunt's trucking. It's a jail, Hunt's hunt trucking. A Hunt's truck was driving by when we asked the name, and that's mm. what he chose. And w w he, he lived with us for five, yeah. eight years before we knew that wasn't his name. What's the, what's the story about the ski drawer in there? <laughs> that's another hired hand, Eric, um, who... Uh, um, Eric was a great dude. Um, I had a lot of extra older brothers along the way. I had a great older brother, and uh, you were awesome. But <laughs> some extras along the way. Eric was one of them. Uh, Durango used to do. Uh, Silverton still does it until last year? We're Question back mark. Again. It's back Is it again. back again? It's a bigger, bigger thing a than when you did it. During, uh, so um, I pulled the ski for Eric to, to compete in the ski during competition. Uh, that was at the fairgrounds when it was still the fairgrounds, I think. So now we're getting into the, the, the education piece yes. and, and how important the family thinks that is and all of the, 
all of the, the work and effort that Tom and Penny put into that. So you see a picture of, of Tom doing some dissection in, in uh, some biology lab that, that he's teaching. And, and on the right-hand side there, you see him petting a baby deer. His PhD thesis was uh, tracking the migration of, of deer and elk or elk populations. Um, and so he's uh, not only tagging the, the young animal, um, but also giving it a little love at the same time. <laughs> He was a professor at Fort Lewis for quite some time. He was uh, president of the Nine R School Board, and he got to give Leanne her diploma there. Uh, the kids have, as we said, have not stayed on the ranch, but they have both been married on the ranch, and you have pictures here of uh, Mora coming in in a uh, horse-drawn cart Carriage. Uh, carriage, whatever you call those. And it was very nice and very pretty. You can't see it very well there. And then uh, Leanne decided that she was going to come in with her uh, father on his horse. Take it away. Okay, Leanne Oops. says, I want to be carried in on, on, uh, on, on Bonanza. And, uh, and I didn't think it was a great idea because Bonanza was a little bit on the cranky side and he hadn't had never been ridden except by myself and Ted and Ted rode him a much better than I did but I was able to stay on for most of the time so Penny and I had to set about on about a three month ac activity of tra break training Bonanza to number one to carry two people at one time and number two to carry a, a, uh, a wedding dress and all that stuff waving around so some of the neighbors thought we were pretty crazy. We had uh, old bed sheets that Penny would get on the back and wave them and keep. But Bonanza learned, and Leanne got carried into her ceremony on the on on Bonanza. Community service. So that's one of the that's other cornerstones. You know, we think is super important. And um, part-time uh, professor at Fort Lewis, uh, president of the Nine R School Board. Uh, he helped start Leadership La Plata where he's still an advisor, uh, served on uh, La Plata Open Space Conservancy after he was an initial director on uh, the Colorado Cattlemen's Open Space Conservancy. Uh, La, uh, La Plata Electric Association, he was on the board for 20 years. Um, at one point, this isn't community service, this is more public service. Uh, he took a break from ranching and uh, Tom and Penny moved back to Washington, D.C. Uh, to, uh, to take a position with uh, Senator Nighthorse Campbell. Uh, Tom was chairman of the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission. He's got a little uh, retirement trophy over there. Um, you know, uh, government, Governor Hickenlooper appointed him to that. Um, president of the Colorado Cattlemen's Wolf Reintroduction Program. And uh, anti-wolf reintroduction. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to travel. Yeah. yeah that's point. Let's we'll go We'll move to on travel. to travel. Okay, you saw the one of us at Uluru. There we are at Easter, uh, on Easter Island. Uh, we are in the Seychelles, and I think the middle one on the bottom is uh, a young lady with bananas on her head in Africa. It is, we, we, you know, one of my, I think, most meaningful experience traveling was Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which I'm sure you all have studied in school if you haven't been there to experience a little bit of that. I knew about it. My history teacher told me about it, and I filed it away, but when we went over there, and we got to see a little bit about what actually happened there. It really uh, tugged at my heart. I got to thinking that the next time uh, Mr. Trump and Mr. Uh, whoever the other side is at the time, that's where they ought to go to have their meetings to talk about how to settle things, because that devastated that country and that, those people. I a uh, picture there of uh, Komodo Dragon. I just always thought those were pretty cool. We got to go to the island. And look, and look at them. There I am with one of my heroes. Got my picture taken with Charles Darwin. As, <laughs> as, as happened to be at Darwin University in Australia. And the last one is a, is the Great Wall of China. We went over there. Actually, it was in April, and and, the, and the, everything said it was going to be about 80 degrees. Well, it snowed the night before we went to the Great Wall. There was about six inches of snow. The Great Wall of China, pretty interesting place. And, Give, gives you a perspective on great walls. I'll leave it at that. 
These are all uh, these are all pictures of a trip that, uh, that that Tom and Penny forced us to go on. Uh, we got to go to Kenya and Tanzania and, and do quite a bit of safari travel and see some some really fantastic stuff. It was uh, it was their wish for their 50th anniversary, so we couldn't say no. The, uh, that's my kids, and I think Cecilia, Ted's daughter, is in there as well. Well, part of our trip when we went over, we um, delivered some educational materials to some different schoolhouses uh, in Africa, um, which is, I just love this picture because it really speaks to what has been instilled in me from my parents and I think from their parents and generations above. I think they have taken a, a lot of the different pieces of their roots and learned that roots are, are, are wonderful, but you have to have wings too. And I think that's kind of what, what we got was roots and wings. We got this place, my kids are fifth generation. Ted's kid is fifth generation uh, Durango. Um, but as the quote at the beginning talked about, um, it's really important to also open your eyes to the rest of the world out there. If you look at that last picture there, that is us at the Hotel Stanley in Nairobi, Kenya. And since we began with a quote, I think it's appropriate that we end with a quote from Hemingway, who spent much of his time at the Hotel Stanley. He said, it is good to have an end to journey toward, but it is the journey that matters in the end. Thank you so much. You have an amazing family. and. Uh, it's even more amazing for another reason here. Did you know that tonight's their 54th wedding anniversary? <laughs> but listen, I've got to tell you something that's even more amazing. Well, I don't know if it's more amazing, but it's pretty amazing. That picture from their wedding anniversary is at the reception, which was here at the Strader Hotel. And Earl Barker basically organized and put their wedding reception on for them. And I just thought it'd be so neat for you folks if Earl's son, Rod, who now owns the hotel, could maybe celebrate your 54th wedding anniversary. I think Rod's got a surprise for you here somewhere. Rod! <laughs> there he is. Oh, yeah. There he is. <laughs> so what do you got there, Rod? Well, we have a little bit of... Uh, uh, oh my God. I, I better let you scoot in there with your wife. <laughs> this is just wonderful. Uh, thank you so very much. It has been a delight. <laughs>